Hi everyone, thanks for being here with me. Uh, a brief self-introduction. Um, my name is Kwan. I am a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. And I will be moving to the University of Michigan as a postdoc in the fall. Today I will tell you about our work on constraining the assembly bias component of the Galaxy Halo connection using count statistics. This talk will be in three parts. First, I'll give you some background then I will introduce our search for the optimal observables that constrain the galaxy halo connection. And finally, I will present our analysis of real data. For those of you who don't think about this every day, galaxies form and evolve in halos. Halos are density peaks of dark matter, which cannot be directly observed, but they can be easily simulated from theory using M-body dark matter only simulations. On the other hand, galaxies can be observed, but they're much more expensive to mock up. So we get galaxies from observation, get halos from theoretical prediction, and use the galaxy halo connection to link them together. The galaxy halo connection provides a fast way to test theory against data. It needs to be marginalized over in cosmological inference, and it informs the physics of galaxy formation and evolution. There are different ways to model the galaxy halo connection, and the halo occupation distribution, the HOD, is an empirical model where the number of galaxies that live in a halo is drawn from a distribution whose mean is a function of halo mass. This figure here shows the dependence, which is controlled by five parameters, and central galaxies and satellite galaxies are modeled separately. For example, alpha controls the steepness of the satellite number de dependence, and mmin determines the smallest halo that can host a galaxy. However, besides the primary effect of halo mass, other halo properties might also play a role in determining the halo's galaxy content, such as concentration, spin, age, assembly history, and so on. We call this effect galaxy assembly bias. This cartoon here explains the concept, taking concentration as an example. At the same halo mass, positive assembly bias can put more galaxies into more concentrated halos, and negative assembly bias puts more galaxies into less concentrated halos. The decorated HOD models the central and satellite assembly bias separately with two more parameters, ASEN and ASET, that control the strength of the effect. But isn't the mass only model good enough? Why should this matter at all? So one, there have been indications from data. In the left panel, we can see that SDSS data prefers positive central assembly bias for certain samples. And two, ignoring the effect, if it is really there, can mess up cosmological inferences. The right panel shows what happens when you fit a sample that has assembly bias with a model that doesn't have assembly bias. So um, the points with error bars are the true satellite red satellite fraction, while the red line and the orange thin lines in the background are the standard mass only HOD fits. So you can see it's way off. So how do we tell if there is assembly bias or not? To test a model, we compare its prediction against data. But we can't do that directly between mock galaxy catalogs and real galaxy catalogs. Because even with the right model, they only agree in a statistical sense due to the stochasticity in the physics. So that's why we need summary statistics to extract information. And we want to find out which statistics are the most sensitive to the galaxy halo connection. Here are our candidates. The projected two-point correlation function, WP, which measures the excess probability of finding galaxy pairs at certain separations in comparison with a field of random points. This is the standard observable that everyone uses. There is delta sigma, the weak lensing signal, which measures the galaxy matter correlation or um, the matter profile around each galaxy. It is often used with WP to constrain the model. The VPF, the void probability function, 
which is when we randomly put spheres into the space and count how many of them do not contain a galaxy. We also looked into count statistics. There is counts in cylinders, where we center a cylinder on every galaxy and count the number of companion galaxies that fall within that cylinder. There is counts in annuli, which is the same thing, but we do the counting not in the small cylinder, but in the larger cylinder with the smaller one at the center cut out. There is Pn to your realm 5, which is the distribution of the ratio of the counts between small and large cylinders. So we first did a theoretical forecast to identify the best combination of the six. This work was published two years ago, and you're welcome to scan the code, uh, which will lead you to the paper. Uh, so we did the forecast using a Fisher analysis. The idea of Fisher analysis is to take the uncertainty in the statistic and calculate the dependence of the statistic on the parameter, which will translate the uncertainty in the statistic into constraints on the model parameters. So here are the results we got. Each panel is a different 2D projection of the parameter space and the contours show the forecasted constraints. The purple is WP alone, blue is uh, delta sigma with cleansing, and red is counts and cylinders. So we can see that in many of the projections, many of the panels, the red cuts through the purple, breaking degeneracies with WP, while the weak cleansing signal delta sigma has very similar information to WP. So this figure, shows the 1D constraints on the assembly bias parameters ASEN and ASAT from different combinations of observables. Note um, that the galaxy number density is always included with WP. So here, shorter bars mean tighter constraints, which is preferable. And count statistics, all three of them, uh, counts in cylinders, counts in annuli, count, uh, the ratio of counts, they outperform weak lensing delta sigma, which is the second group of bars, in all of the samples and for both parameters. And also WP plus any of the three count statistics performs similarly to the combination of all six together. So the conclusion is that count statistics are a better complement to the two point function. Now we apply this finding to real data. We select volume limited luminosity threshold samples from Sloan Data Release 7. So here is a scatter plot of galaxies from which we select uh, our samples. The x axis is the observed redshift of galaxies, and the y axis is the R band absolute magnitude. So we require galaxies to be within a redshift range which is the volume limit, and we require them to have R-band magnitudes brighter than our luminosity thresholds. For the minus 20 and the minus 19.5 samples, we additionally use alternative redshift limits to select alternative samples that exclude the Sloan Great Wall. So um, here are measurements of the number density and the projected two-point correlation function, WP. Uh, in our measurements, fiber collision is accounted for using the nearest neighbor correction. So here, each of the first five panels is a different luminosity threshold, and the last panel compares the five with vertical offsets for visual clarity. So the lines are spaced out. Um, on the x-axis is the projected separation RP, and the y-axis shows um, WP, the clustering strength. Um, the galaxy number density is shown as text in each panel. Uh, so we see that brighter samples have lower number densities, and they cluster more strongly. And here are measurements of the counts in cylinder statistic. The x-axis is the number of companions that fall within the cylinder around each uh, galaxy. So our cylinders have a radius of 2 megaparsecs per age and a half length of 10 megaparsecs per age. 
So the x-axis is the number of companions, and the y-axis is the probability distribution of the number of companions, which is normalized by bin widths. We can see that fainter samples have more companions on the whole, which is also expected. Now we want to fit this measurement with our model. But before that, there are problems we need to solve. SDSS data is a light cone. It has complicated geometry and has various observational effects, like fiber collision, redshift measurement uncertainties, and so on. So can the simulation cube give unbiased estimates of the data statistics? To verify that, we create mocks. First, um, we populate the halos in the cubic simulation volume to get a galaxy catalog. And then we use the same galaxy catalog to produce light cone mocks that have the geometry of the data, have fiber collision, redshift uh, uncertainty um, in it. So all the observational effects um, that are present in data. But they also have the same underlying physics as the cubic mock. So if our measurements of the statistics from the cubic mock and from the light cone mocks are consistent with an error, that means the cube mock can give unbiased estimates of the light cone mock statistics and hence the data. So these figures show the results of our consistency check. Um, the first figure is number density. Um, the um, red, the pink um, histogram in the background is um, the distribution of number density measurements for each individual light cone walk. And each panel is a different luminosity threshold. So the thick vertical red line shows the uh, mean measurement from the different light cones. The black line, uh, the black vertical line, is the measurement from the cube, which is kind of the true value that we want to recover from the cones. So the black error bars is the total jackknife covariance from both the cube and the cones. So now we want the red lines to fall within the black error bars. And that means our number density measurements from the cube and the cones are consistent, which is the case for all five of our samples. And now for WP and counts in cylinders, um, the co-measurements are shown as fractional deviation from the cube measurements. The thinner red lines in the background are individual cone walks, and the thick red line is the mean of the cone walks. So again, uh, the black error bars um, show the total jackknife co uh, covariance from the cube and the cone. So we want the red line to be within the range of the black arrow bars. And that means consistency between the cube and the cones, which is also true for WP and Council cylinders for all five samples. So that's good. That means that we can use the cube simulation to fit our measurements of the data. So uh, we then proceed to run MCMCs um, using covariances from the cube simulation and from the data. And um, here are some preliminary results. This is for the minus 20 uh, sample. So uh, each, each panel with a contour is um, a 2D projection of the parameter space. And each 1D histogram is an individual parameter. So the blue uh, shows the constraints from number density plus WP, and the cyan uh, shows the constraints from number density, WP, and counts and cylinders. So we can see that uh, even though the cyan contours are not quite converged yet, 
they're already tighter than the blue contours, which is WP and uh, number density. Um, and there is a slight hint of a mild tension between the two, which um, may suggest that um, the standard HRD model is insufficient to model both WP and cancer cylinders. And we're really curious to see um, whether with um, the assembly bias parameters, the decorated HRD model can do better. So I will put um, up to date results in this repository, uh, which uh, the QR code leads to. So um, please stay tuned for our latest results. Um, and any questions and comments are welcome. Uh, thank you.